I'm Joe Devine and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. Today I'm joined by Alex Stewart to discuss Marouan Fellaini in part one and Kevin De Bruyne in part two. This is off the back of two recent videos we made on the pair on our YouTube channel as part of the Tactical Profile series. You don't need to watch them to listen to this podcast, uh, but you can if you like. One further thing before we get started, the launch of our new website and a full name change to TIFO has been delayed by a couple of weeks. We'll be shifting to our new site from midway through November now, uh, so the YouTube channel name should change around then as well. Please continue to like and subscribe and all the rest of it, and I hope you enjoy this week's episode. At the time of recording, uh, Manchester United have announced an injury to Marouane Fellaini, which will likely see him uh, needing a number of weeks to recover. So it's a shame that he won't be able to continue uh, what's uh, seen as his sort of positive form throughout you know, the next few games. However, um, on that form, Alex, were you surprised initially to see that Fellaini being, or see that Fellaini was being chosen ahead of Ander Herrera when the injury to Pogba announced? And I wondered, you know, is that an issue of pecking order, do you think? Or is that uh, particular skills and particular opponents, that sort of thing? Uh, I think it's playing to the strengths that Mourinho looks for in his players. So he likes people who will do what he says. Uh, And I'm not saying that Herrera wouldn't, but Fellaini has shown himself to be tactically quite adaptable. Um, He also does like big players, physically large players, and he likes people who will track up and down and work hard for the rest of the team. That's particularly important with a two-man midfield access. So... I suppose while I'm quite a fan of Herrera's actually, and I think he was one of the few players to come out of the Van Gaal era with with genuine credit, it didn't surprise me enormously that Mourinho went for somebody who's bigger, stronger, uh, and probably brings more of an all-round threat uh, to what Manchester United can do. Well, what, what does this mean for Herrera then? Because I remember, I mean, obviously he was voted their player, Manchester United's player of the season last season. Um, and also I remember in particular games he was very impressive, particularly against Chelsea. I remember he played that man-marking role um, uh, on Hazard. Um, we talked about that at the time. It seemed then that, you know, he was tactically adapt- adaptable, which is the term that you use for, for Fellaini, and it seemed that Mourinho was trusting him with um, roles that were perhaps more tactically or required more tactical intelligence or at least positional intelligence um, than a lot of other midfield roles would. So I wonder, what does that mean for him? It, will we likely see him feature in bigger games? I'm aware that Man United haven't really played any particularly tough opponents yet. Maybe we might see him, you know, against Chelsea again or, or the Manchester Cities of the league. What, what do you think about that? I think Herrera's been the victim of of other players doing well rather than Herrera being in any way worse than he was last season. Mourinho seems to have preferred this two-man midfield access for much of the season and brought in Matic to play a particular role and Matic has played very well so far. Obviously when Pogba was fit he wasn't going to leave Pogba out either and, and Matic and Pogba together were performing excellently. Do you, do you think it might be the case that Herrera doesn't, on his own, doesn't fit either of those two sort of fairly specific roles? I, I think so, yes. I think um, I think Herrera probably, to my mind, works best in a three uh, where he's sort of the... I suppose a kind of shuttle runner, you know, he's sort of moving up and down, he's providing short passes, he's keeping things taking over, all of which are things that we highlighted as as Fellaini being able to do as well. Um, Fellaini's just able to dominate that midfield space more with his, his strength and his aerial ability when there are only two midfielders in there. If Herrera was playing in a three with, say, Fellaini and Matic or, or Pogba, and Matic when they're fit, I think he would he would suit that much more because the 
the lack of uh, strength and height that he has would be compensated by the other two players alongside him. But I think Mourinho maybe feels that uh, United's midfield area would be a little exposed physically if if Herrera plus because Matic is not the quickest in the world, um, and and while he does have that strength and height, you, you kind of ideally want want both players to be able to to kind of front up when there's only two of them and, and try and dominate that midfield space with with those two players. Like I say, I think if if United were playing a three man midfield, then then Herrera would be you know quite a natural fit in that role because as you say he's not a stupid player you know he he can do a variety of things very very competently um it may be as well that at some point he's going to get an opportunity to play uh slightly further up the pitch i could see him doing that say if there were a, an injury to somebody that either if there were an injury to Mikatarian, he he would come out maybe herrera could could slot in slightly further up the pitch or if there were an injury that forced Mkhitaryan out wide then Herrera could play in that central space as well. Or do you think perhaps that Mourinho might look to push Pogba up there and bring Fellaini in behind? That would be a very Mourinho thing to do just because he does have this love of of um, players that are big and strong. Mm. Um, you know I think he, he very much likes everyone if possible to be over six foot because I think he recognises both in terms of um, of dominating the central space and picking up second balls, but also providing a, a set piece threat. That that's something that he goes for. Um, but at the same time, having a player of Herrera's quality never getting a look in would be odd. And he is comfortable playing smaller players in in the attacking four. I mean, Mkhitaryan is not a big guy. Juan Mata is not a big guy. So. It, it's very much further back that he wants that kind of real physical element. OK, back to Fellaini. Uh, we've talked about him before as a destroyer of sorts. Um, and we've also talked about him playing, you know, higher up the field in the number 10 role uh, to negate deeper line playmakers in the opposition side. But it seems, you know, of, of late that Fellaini's role has been sort of more of an all round thing, um, slightly more complex. Uh, I've seen a few heat maps for his recent performances um, before he was injured, and he seems to be popping up all over the place. What are the you know the the, the key tenets of his role, if you could um, define it for us? Well, yeah, certainly being all over the pitch. I mean, if you if you look at where he's winning aerial duels, which is obviously something he's particularly good at, uh, it's everywhere from his own penalty area up to the opposition penalty area, and he does have that dynamism um, that. I think in some ways Man United have, have lacked for quite some time, really, a player who can impose themselves across the length of the pitch um, in in a kind of impose themselves in a robust physical way rather than in terms of their skill. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm not enough of a Manchester United fan necessarily to to know everybody, but you, like Roy Keane is maybe the last player who who quite so dynamically was everywhere and was always kind of in the right place at the right time and Fellaini does seem to have a kind of knack for that and you can you can even see that in the way that he's popped up to score important goals recently and and it was um you know we we highlighted his appearance um behind Lukaku uh, when Lukaku scored against Southampton with that headed goal, and and in the next match that United played, there was Fellaini popping up in exactly the same place this time to score himself. So, you know, he really is up and down. I think the 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 main thing that he seems to be trying to do is is keep this ticking over of possession. He's very much the kind of focal point for recycling the ball quickly. So he's not going to create a defence splitting pass in the same way that Matic is. He's not going to be able to carry the ball in the same way that Martial or Rashford or Mata can. What he can do is take the ball and lay it off quickly to somebody else and move around so that he provides that point of recycling for everybody else so that the more creative players can then move into space. And of course, he's able to do that because he has the strength to hold other players off. 
So you can play the ball into him and he's not going to lose it. I suppose also in certain scenarios he attracts a lot of defenders. I mean, if we're thinking about set pieces specifically or, or even you know, situations in open play in which it's clear that a cross is going to be brought in. He, you know, if he's in the box, all of a sudden he's a, he seems to have the biggest gravity pull apart from Lukaku that he drags all defenders towards him and creates space for everyone else. So it's a sort of uh, selfless role in some ways as well. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that is, you know, if I, I suspect if you ask Mourinho to define the, the one quality that he wants from his players, it would be something like selflessness. Uh, possibly even courage, if that's not a slightly um, reductive, quote unquote, English way of saying it. Um, and and having a player who is prepared to take the ball under pressure, hold defenders off, and and allow the other the other players, the more creative players, the 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 time to find the space to then do what they do. You know, having a player like that in any side is hugely important. Um, in fact, that's a, that's a key point you, you mentioned there about allowing the more creative players to do what they do, because also the role reversal of that is true. Um, in fact, I saw today that Juan Mata had published a little well-wishing note to Fellaini on his blog, uh, which is uh, a, a quite amusing read sometimes. Um, Mata, in fact, seems to play a role integrally linked to Fellaini's when the pair are on the field together. You note in the video... Uh, that when Fellaini will, uh, you know, push up to support Lukaku, Mata will often drop off into the space, you know, almost to 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 to, uh, to fill that role. So it seems that the the reverse is also true that the creative players are also creating space and opportunities for the players who, who would arguably be seen as less creative. Yeah, well, I think um, match the day uh, in in their sort of um, striving to become more analytical. Um, showed uh, that matter was doing that was was covering, making tackles and working hard and and obviously again you know we we know that Mourinho values this we know that that that's one of the reasons that he fell out with um, some of the more creative players at Chelsea was they weren't prepared to to knuckle down in quite the same way as he'd experienced with with players at Porto players at Inter and. Um, I think Mata has shown an enormous willingness to not just expect that his role is in and around the edges of the penalty area, where he is obviously an extraordinarily useful player. He's, you know, he's a very talented, creative player. But for the balance of the team, particularly when the the one kind of physical upfront presence is Lukaku, and he can't do everything on his own. My, mm. much as he a tries and b actually seems to be able to a lot of the time. I mean, he is <laughs> he's having an astonishing season so far. But but allowing Fellaini to get up and support him, and like you say, to to drag defenders around, um, you can't do that and leave a massive space uh, on the right hand side. And with Valencia particularly pushing up high uh, from right fullback. It would be very easy for Manchester United to to leave this kind of big gap for a, a lateral ball into that uh, what would be the opponent's left half space. Um, if Fellaini had pushed up and Matters covering back of that is absolutely crucial and shows that kind of willingness that that togetherness that Manchester United seem to have found this season. Well, that brings me on to the next question as well because I wanted to ask you um, the th- about the thinking behind having two such different types of uh, wide players uh, up front for United. Obviously, on the left, we've seen that role uh, shift between Martial and Rashford, whoever seems to be performing better or scoring more goals. I mean, both of them seem to be playing very well this season. On the right, it's been you know fairly uh, consistently one matter, and he's a very different player. Uh, to I mean, obviously, both sides are, are inverted in that the players on the left have are right-footed and the, and and matter on the right is left-footed but he's you know he's not really speedy he's not dribbling so often at defenders he has a very different role and i wanted to ask you is that linked to valencia and fellaini is it is that just about balance what's the thinking behind having two different roles on either side i think it's partly that yes um i think that that valencia certainly is is encouraged to get forward a lot um but then you know Ashley Young is doing that quite a lot from left back as well I I think it's probably just a question of of who's actually available um 
and the fact that there there maybe isn't uh, a right winger who can um uh, i suppose replicate that that kind of direct driving attacking threat that that Martial well, what, and... what about playing Rashford on the right and Martial on the left um well that could potentially limit how much Fellaini could get forward I don't think it would limit how much Valencia could get forward but if you did that you you certainly would I don't want to say you'd be lighter but you you wouldn't necessarily have the same degree of of intelligent covering backwards that Mata provides um so uh, that's not to say that Martial and Rashford aren't intelligent players but they are they are strikers first and foremost really so their instinct is always going to be to get forward and to get into the box. And I think potentially if United played as a 4-3-3 and had someone like Herrera in that midfield three, then you could get away with playing Martial and Rashford either side of Pogba because you'd have that greater solidity across the midfield. And I think actually that would work really, really well against some teams. And there wouldn't be room for matter in that, but it means that the the positioning can kind of switch around so that you're almost then playing with two up front when Rashford or Martial drifts in from the left. You've then got a kind of attacking midfield two, but more central with Mkhitaryan and Mata, and then behind them you've got Matic and Fellaini who can you know push up and drop back as they need to. So. It, it just does create a bit more of that balance, yes. OK, a word on supporter perception now. Fellaini has uh, dramatically risen in the view of many Manchester United supporters. Do you think that's um, purely down to improved performances or is it more to do with a more broadly held belief in Jose Mourinho? Um, I, I think I think the two things go hand in hand, don't they? Um supporters are you know Manchester United supporters are an unusual bunch in that they've been used to a great degree of success for a long period of time followed by relative in lack of success um, but also quite a significant change in style um, and a perception that the club was was going backwards both in terms of what it was achieving but also the way it was playing um and so i can understand that it's taken some time for them to warm to to what's happening now Mourinho seems to have have found a style that works and to have engendered a, a really strong sense of of team ethic um in that group of players when that happens and the team therefore play with more confidence, the fans are happier about what's happening. It creates this virtuous circle whereby not only do players play better, but also their performances are recognised as such. I mean, you, you, you know, you could have had really good performances by players in the Van Gaal era or in the Moyes era, and they probably wouldn't have got the acclaim and the respect that they deserved. Unless you're Adnan Yanazai. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but Yanazai was kind of, Yanazai was he- one of those players that, that people wanted to see do well because he was kind of like a throwback to how United were supposed to play in the past. You know, he was he was attacking, tricky, dribbly kind of winger. And, and I think in the doldrums of particularly the Moyes era, you know, there was like, oh... Can we not have more of this, please? Someone who seems to want to go out and yeah. do stuff. He was a winger that wasn't crossing it 93 times per game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it works for some people. It didn't work there. But I think, um, yeah, as 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 the players do better and Mourinho gets them working well together, the supporters become more positive, the players respond well to that, and it's easier to then create an environment in which you can celebrate you know celebrate how people are doing even when they are players that others don't i Fellaini seems to me to be the sort of player that actually you know if he plays for your team you really like him and if he plays for anyone else then you know you think of he's he's a thug and a clogger and 
and he, you know, he can be free with his elbows and all the rest of it. But what is this um, word clogger? You use that in the script as well. I've never heard it before. I wonder if it's <laughs> I d- specific I... to your family or region or something. Clogger. I d- I don't know. I, I kind of. I suppose I meant. Um... I think I know what you mean. Yeah, I've just never heard I, that word. He's a okay. thug and a clogger. Yeah, I d- it's sounds like an Ian Brown lyric or something. Possibly, I don't know. I d- maybe maybe listeners can. Tell me where I picked that up, because I genuinely can't remember. Clogger. Anyway, that's Fellaini. Uh, come back in part two for a talk about Kevin De Bruyne. OK, Kevin De Bruyne, uh, you seem to see him as totally central to Manchester City this season. For example, uh, in the video, we discuss Pep's two groups of five tactic in which his team, when in possession, will always look to have five players in line with or ahead of the ball and five players behind. Kevin De Bruyne tends to be the player in possession at those times, or at least a lot of the time that's the case, which presumably makes him the the dictator of much of of City's play? Yeah, is the short answer. Um, I mean, obviously, there are going to be different players who find themselves in possession, but I think it's very clear from watching City that particularly when they attack at pace, um, the aim seems to be to transition the ball through carrying it up into the opponent's final third as quickly as possible and then get it back to De Bruyne, who then kind of quarterbacks the move from that point on. Um, he also is the kind of uh, focal point if, and I think we highlighted this in the video as well, say Kyle Walker carries it out from right fullback at pace, he will get to a certain point, then lay it off to De Bruyne, who will then find him with a reverse pass and Walker will carry on on his way. So he's kind of the the fulcrum for those sorts of moves from wide as well. Um, What's interesting about him is that he's still quite young. I mean, he's 23, 24, something like that. Um, this is this is the sort of role that you would, you know, tend to associate with a player who is getting, you know, a little bit older, uh, 28, 29, um, and is uh, pulling back into that orchestrator role. Um, I, I remember, you know, Paul Scholes didn't really start doing doing that for Manchester United until he was a little bit older as well. I, I mean, is that is does this suggest quite a lot about his potential that he's already fulfilling what is fairly intelligent and, you know, a role with a lot of responsibility at, at, at his age? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't put this in the video, although I toyed with it. Um, he kind of basically almost reminds me of an Andrea Pirlo who can run. Like, I think he's... I think he's got the potential to be that good. Um, And his ability to find space. And this was the thing that was always so beautiful to watch about Pirlo. And I do mean the word beautiful. um, Was that he was always unhurried. And he always seemed to just drift nonchalantly into an area of the pitch where others weren't. And if you watch Man City this season, um, which I have done with genuine pleasure, despite not being a Man City fan, um, De Bruyne is always in that space. He always somehow seems to find whether it's because he, he runs quickly up into it and then stops or he drops back ever so gently and finds it that way. He just he just operates with this kind of four or five yards uh, circle around him without opposition players in it and that that's not because the opposition players don't realise how dangerous he is he just seems to have that ability um, and that's why I think he he's taken on that role for, for City of being the kind of you know the operations director almost because he is the the person who can get the ball and have the time either to then pass it back out to one of the the quickies or to you know <laughs> ping it long across what what are you laughing That's at so loving quickie? quickies yeah, just because right. earlier we were you know cloggers and quickies i feel like yeah. you're developing your own tactics dictionary okay possibly um <laughs> uh, the football clichés might have something to say about that mm. um yeah i mean but you know, Man City are a side with a huge amount of pace and 
And the thing with lots of players who are very, very quick is you need somebody who is able to pass the ball to the area that they're going to be in three seconds time. Um, because it's very easy to to overrun those passes. It's very easy to hit them too long, too short. Um, and the skill level required to operate with that um, is remarkable. And and I, you know, it's my personal opinion that De Bruyne is the the best central midfielder in the league at the moment. Uh, I don't know what what listeners think about that, or even what you think about that, but. He just seems to be able to do everything, and uh, you know his goal recently against um, whoever it was 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 awesomely good as well. You know the way he took that that inside reverse pass, one touch, and then just absolutely ha- it was against Chelsea, wasn't it? A hammered it past Courtois. Um, so you know he's got a little bit of everything, really. Well, the commenters can't speak for all of the listeners, of course, um, but we did leave a pin comment on uh, the last podcast we uploaded, saying. There's a video out tomorrow on a player who uh, is potentially the best in the league. Any guesses? Um, and I think three of seven of the first responses were Kevin De Bruyne, um, one of whom said by a fair distance. So, it, you know, yeah. it suggests that pa- perhaps people do recognise that. Well, I, I mean, I think you're looking at two, to me, two clear favourites for the league title this season, um, the two Manchester clubs. And of the two Manchester clubs, the standout player in either squad is De Bruyne. Um, For United, I think it's a little harder to pick because I think they've got a lot of people operating at just a notch below De Bruyne. And I also think they're more probably cohesive. Um, So maybe Pogba, maybe Mkhitaryan. But I I think De Bruyne is the guy who is making it happen for the most exciting team to watch in the league this season. And and that, you know, it's it's harder to... It's always hard to qualify who the best person, particularly given that, you know, people have played different positions and have different roles. But if if you're the person who gets a tactically complex and hugely exciting side to function, then that's got to be quite a strong recommendation. Yeah. I mean, you've already sort of answered this one by comparing him to Andrea Perlo. Um, but, you know, we say, we're we talking about him as the best midfielder in the league. I'm I'm wondering if we can put that into any greater context. You know, is he, is he on par with the greats now, do you think? Is, I mean, presumably this is something we see that he might hold in his future. Um, beyond Andrea Perlo, is there anyone else that, that he reminds you of? I suppose it depends how you qualify greatness. And I think players... I mean, to me, one of the, the greatest Premier League players is Matt Letizia. Um, But Letizia never won anything. So it's quite difficult to to sort of, to, you know, if you've got somebody who's who's in a, an otherwise pretty average team, but capable of doing extraordinary things, but can never lift that team to reach the heights of winning anything, are they a comparable player? So I think we maybe want to, wait and see how this city side matures over the next couple three years maybe before we can really bracket him with you know the greats either in the Premier League or or more generally but I think I think stylistically uh yes he's he's got elements of Paul Scholes I think um with the the way that he can switch the direction of play the way that he can pick um really uh, superb passes between the lines um, for people that are running onto it. Uh, I think he's got some of Pirlo about him, certainly. Um, it's, but he, yeah, I mean, it, we do, it's very easy when you're, when you're commenting on, on football and particularly with this kind of very quick, you know, news cycle and everyone's got to have something fresh and interesting to say all the time to get lured into the, ah, oh, he, he's the greatest or he's mm. the, the, you know. It's quickies, clogger. Quickies, clogger. These sorts of things. Exactly. So, yeah. yes, is he, the, is he, in my opinion, the best player so far in the season? Yes, but I'm, I'm not prepared to say much more than that. We can't ignore the fact, uh, well, I suppose, I mean, we could, we could. But uh, we won't ignore the fact that Chelsea let him go uh, before before he, he he is what before he was what he is now. 
Um, but it strikes me, and I'm not sure whether I'm right or not, this might be totally anecdotal, but it strikes me that, that Chelsea are, are playing Fabregas in a, in, a, in a deeper, creative role this season, um, and Kevin De Bruyne might have fit quite nicely in there. Yeah, I mean, Fabregas... I, I don't think we should forget how well Fabregas did last season, albeit in, in limited minutes. But, you know, creatively, he was exceptional in that deeper role and he's still a, a very fine player. Um, I think Chelsea caught a lot of people unawares um, with their three four three last season. And that maybe masked some of the deficiencies in the squad um, because... They they were very lucky with injuries. They had they had players operating in a system that most people seemed unprepared for and operating at a consistently high level without getting injured. Doing that the next season on, um, people have kind of adjusted. We're seeing through at the back a lot more in the league anyway, and you kind of feel like maybe that squad needed a certain refresh, particularly in that that deeper creative position. I suppose I was very surprised they they let Matic go. I mean, I'm I'm sure there were behind-the-scenes reasons for that and lots of money involved and and what have you, but it does seem to to stick a burden on on Fabregas to to make... You know, Kante's a, a very, very fine midfielder, but he's not going to create anything for you, and you can't simply get the ball to the front three and then expect them to do something um and if you look at at other sides with you know sort of fluid front threes they they always have somebody sitting further back who can play a really good pass um you know Emre Chan at at Liverpool for example so I, I think I think Chelsea will rue the fact that I mean obviously it wasn't on Conte's watch was it but that they'll rue the fact that that De Bruyne isn't there uh, and that they didn't move to to find somebody capable of of playing that sort of pass. And Chalabar, was, obviously, he's out on loan as well, isn't he? So they've, they've, they 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 don't have somebody else who can do that kind of thing. Um, Danny Drinkwater. <clears throat> yeah, I um, I mean, Drinkwater is he doesn't have the versatility, um, and I think. A lot of what Leicester were able to do, yes, you know, Drinkwater was capable of kind of lobbing bombs over that Vardy could chase onto. Um, but it was still predominantly the vardy Mares access, access, access uh, in their league winning season. <laughs> it's not, sorry. <laughs> Shall I no, start like a, a Hollywood reporter. Okay. It's the vardy Mares access. No, carry on. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think Drinkwater just isn't at that level really Um, he's a thirsty character yeah that's yeah he's a liquid midfielder that doesn't mean anything he loves h2o that doesn't work no that doesn't work anyway um i think that'll do for now uh i did scan through uh the the previous videos of yours alex to, to see if i could find any worthwhile questions um from listeners uh, the only comment I, I stumbled across which I wanted to share with you was from someone whose name I, I have forgotten, I didn't write it down but uh, that person said it sounds like you've been smoking for a hundred years <laughs> so I thought I'd share that with you in case you missed that Yeah. Okay. but that's that's all okay, well it's, I, it's not a hundred years but it's yeah it's, it's getting, a clogger, it's over 20 it actually is a clogger, smoking yeah. it is a clogger yeah, I'm starting to get significant heat on the old smoking thing, so I should probably mm. I should probably give it a rest for a while. Okay, well, none of that heat will come from us. Thanks very much for, for, for joining us, and we'll speak to you again soon. Thanks, Joe. Speak soon.